welcome back. I'm Betty Van Jack, and this is What Who's Cooking. Today we have a very special guest, John Schumann, and John is an expert. Uh, he's an author, correct? Yes. And he's a columnist. Right. And he's a certified appraiser. Right. I even a little birdie told me you were once on the road show, yeah. the antique road show. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Oh, you're working towards that. Okay. And John has brought with him many, many things to show up. Some of them you're going to know what they are right away, and some of them I still don't know what they are after they told me what they are. So I'm just going to let John start, and he can tell us what he wants to tell us and show us what he wants to show us. This is his own collection, I believe. Is yes, it not? that's correct. Okay. So why don't we start with that? Okay. It's my pleasure to be here, and of course... Uh, a lot of people out there in the audience uh, collect uh, all kinds of things, and obviously some of you uh, do cooking. And uh, throughout the ages, we've used all kinds of canning processes and smoking of meats and uh, freezing them and what have you. Uh, obviously, this is a, an old mason jar dated 1858, and it has the zinc lid with the uh, milk glass insert. You need rubber, a uh, rubber uh, right. insert in yes. there, don't you? And this was a device for taking the jars out of the hot water, and uh, also you could use it to remove the lids, uh, like this. Um, if someone were baking and wanted to sift their flour, this would be another instrument that would uh, come in quite handy. And um, when you're baking uh, pies and cakes, cakes specifically, with this particular item, you would use uh, a piece like this. Here's another mason jar from the 1920s, which has uh, an interesting uh, wire bale handle. These were made down at the uh, Diamond Glass Factory. They have the uh, diamond on the, the backs of the uh, salts and peppers. Is that the diamond glass that was in Royersford? In Royersford. They're no longer in business. And um, when you wanted to squeeze your lemons, you'd slice the lemon in half and use this as a device. This is a sun-kissed uh, milk glass piece. That doesn't um, look much different than the today no. A lot yesterday. of these, a lot of these things are very similar to contemporary. These are kind of unusual. They're glass fruit molds, and um, you would turn them over like this and put your jellies or your jams in them. Of course, Jello was one of the very famous manufacturers. Now the artisans when they had cows they would milk the cows of course and they would make their butter and when you would go to market you would impress your butter and this particular impression is carved and it shows a pineapple and uh, that's the fruit that's the symbol of hospitality. Right, right? and yeah. here is a, a little fruit design a, a clover like uh, design and uh, then we have of course, the stove, which is very important, and then I'm, I also have over there a very rare 1897 book, if you just hand that to me, sure. which shows uh, all of the stoves that were being manufactured up in the Scranton area, and maybe you can uh, key in on this with the camera and sh uh, see these lovely steel engraved pieces. I'll show you one more piece in here. Um, that's a stove. These are all various stoves, right. And this is a child's stove here. So the, the children uh, got into um, the act, and uh, these are very collectible today. Then uh, when you had hot liquids in a container, you would set the uh, pot, for example, that large pot over there, like the coffee pot, the agate coffee pot. Oh, this pot. Right, you would set that on what is called a trivet. And uh, we'll just move along here quickly. Um, when you made ice cream, you scream. We all scream for ice cream. And you would dip it out and then flip it on the inside here. And that would release the ice cream. Um, this obviously is uh, for uh, breaking up the ice, an ice pick, um, for beating up eggs and then sundry items. This is a very unusual little piece. It's wood. The camera can pan in on that. Yeah. And you would hold that and use it to scrape off the kernels of corn that were on the cob. Is it sharp? 
Yes, it's got a sharp point on it. This is brass, and this was a pie crimper. You take and actually crimp the outside edge of the pie and cut the, the dough with this. Um, this is a food strainer with a wooden handle. I have one of those. It's right. the only thing I have that you this have. This is a here. very interesting piece. The lid comes up on it, and you'd have a big block of ice, and it has a sharp razor blade on here, and you would actually scrape off the ice, and then you could use that around, say, uh, puddings or shrimp or whatever to keep them chilled. Here is a little cookie cutter, um, and this device was used for slicing salt, or uh, excuse me, cheese. Um, this looks like a plumbing tool, but actually it's uh, used for taking the uh, lids off of uh, bottles. And this was used for opening and closing the bottles, putting the, the lids on. Is that what you use to make root beer? It could be used <laughs> to make root beer, right? Um, this was a nice little piece to hold when you're serving hot chocolates. Um, here's an unusual toaster. There's so many things here to cover. <laughs> oh, we have time. <laughs> okay. And uh, I still buy the, the coffee beans and put, keep them in the freezer. And you'd open this up and you can set and regulate the thumb screw on this. And the coffee beans, of course, uh, come out ground in different assortments. They're referred to as lap coffee grinders. They sold originally in the general stores for 25 to 30 cents. Oh, wow. And today they're two, three hundred dollars depending upon the condition and the quality. This is a very nice and very collectible piece Why don't you called, go closer? A, called a sponge pitcher. And if you were making, for example, pancakes, this is what you would use for uh, pouring the batter in and pouring it onto your griddle. That's very collectible, isn't it? That's a very collectible piece. This does not have the original lid, but this is a bean pot. And it's glazed on the inside, but not glazed on the outside. And when they made butter, they would take the butter and they would use the butter ladles to, wow. um, get, large. <laughs> to, to get the uh, liquid out of the butter before they put it into the butter presses. I saw them making cheese the other day on television, and they talked about curds and whey. Mm -hmm. Is that what they do with butter, too? Right, yes, exactly. Now, this is an interesting art all of its own. Um, if you had, for example, a hive of bees, and then you took off the honey, and then you would run strings down through this mold and put uh, little pieces of wood here and pour these, and you would get these beeswax candles. They would come out like that. Um, the rule of thumb is the more holes you have in a tin um, candle mold, the, the more valuable it is, the rarer it is. Are there and any bigger than that? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And then um, this is not to pinch the noses of bad schoolboys and girls, but this is to actually put the candle out. And here is a early tin um, or cast iron, actually. Um, candle mold, and it's a push-up type. And then it was also used at butchering time, where they would sharpen this and scrape off the bristles off of the hog. Um, oh, dual purpose, Dual right? purpose. Strange then, dual purpose, but dual purpose. <laughs> since candles were of a high premium in colonial times, they kept them in candle boxes so that the rodents would not eat them. And this is a very nice uh, red lead box with uh, a thumb insert here so that it slides back and forth easily. The rats ate wax? Yes, they would. Mm -hmm. Guess they eat anything, and huh? To go back to this candle snuffer, here is the, the tray that it sits on. Um, people were very functional. They used things in a functional way, but they also liked to also uh, decorate and, and use them. Um, in, in nice ways. This is uh, for slaw cutting and cabbage cutting and 
There's different grades and degrees here of, of ways of creating the fineness. You could also uh, do radishes and cheese on this. I have one of those. <laughs> They're, they came in all different sizes. And they look, it looks exactly like that. I'm sure I didn't shapes. get it that long ago. And this I got at a farm auction back in the 60s upstate. I was originally born and raised in Bloomsburg. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's got a variety of different spices in it. I think I paid 25 or 50 cents for this, and I've seen them in the co-ops up in Adamstown as high as 250, 265, 300 dollars today. I have a friend that had a spice box, a little different, a little bigger, that was given to the uh, museum in Philadelphia, and I think it was some, it was uh, around 62,000 mm -hmm. dollars. They were very, very spices were the gold of that time. Right. You know that that was what they had. If they had spices, they were rich. Now, uh, if you can find pieces in curly maple or walnut or cherry. And this is a very desirable rolling pin. And as I turn it, the camera can pick that up and see the curl in the rolling pin. Yeah. And these sell for uh, 75 to $250, depending upon the condition. Uh, you would keep your cooking items, your special recipes, in a little box like this. This is tinware or tollware decorated. And again, uh, to keep the rodents and the silverfish from eating the paper, um, you would protect it th that way. I want to mention before we go on, if anyone wants to get in touch with John, uh, you, they can uh, write here to uh, the graphic at the end with the, the address and all, post office box 1660, and I'll pass it along to uh, John and okay. see if he can help you. All right, and then you would have your tin uh, holder to hold your matches, and you could strike them on the side here to start your uh, fire in the stove. Um, this is kind of a curious item. And believe it or not, it's just nothing more than a piece of leather stapled onto a piece of wood. And then it's been cut. And uh, of course, you would try to catch the fly off guard so he didn't uh, spread disease. These little tin pieces were used in uh, the sugar maple industry to make sugar candy, and they came in different designs. I love that candy. They yeah. still make it today. It's very good. Mm -hmm. What haven't we covered here? Uh, well, we didn't do this. OK. Here's a, a little item. And this could be something that perhaps the audience might not know what it is, but I'll tell you what it is. And you would hold it like this. And then you would hold your ear of corn and actually husk off the outside casing of the corn. Um, this one we didn't touch on. This one opens and closes. And this is to core out uh, the centers of apples. How about this, this one we didn't do? OK. And this is used to slice the cheese. So you have very thin slices of cheese. Did we do that? this one? No, we did not do that. This is funny. So very, very, early, <laughs> very early bottle opener. How would that work? You mean a bottle cap? Yeah, mm -hmm. to take the caps off and also to open the cans. Oh, I see you it. See now. it there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought it was tweezers. Right. Guess I didn't know. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, we didn't touch. There is so much here. Right. Do we have? Well, I brought along something that maybe we can show to try to stomp the audience. Do that later on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's I see. I didn't touch on these. Oh, how about those? Okay. This is uh, to, and they, these come in various sizes, smaller and larger, and you would use them to cut out your batter before you made your tiered uh, leveled cake. And Mrs. Smith is no more in Pottstown, but this is one of the original uh, plates that they used. And here is a muffin container. They still look the same today, mm -hmm. They look the same today. And now, John, John, you published six books? I've done six books. I, I have two okay. others now that are uh, being uh, considered by publishers. Okay, here and, we have, uh, look, can you get this here? Yeah, oh, there it is. There it's already there. There are three of my books, the American Art Glasses in its third printing, the um, Gaudy Dutch, Gaudy Welsh is in its second printing, and the Native American Collectibles just came out recently. I do a lot of my own photography, and I get into historical societies and museums and get an opportunity that way to 
see things with a hands-on approach. I actually John, met John at a street fair. Right. In Phoenixville. Right. But you don't know who you're going to meet on the street these days. No, you never and know. He had done some appraising for me. So, do you think we hit everything here? I believe. You didn't have any more? I, I believe we've covered most of the things. Can we do that? Here's a little um, picture that was has a brown glaze on it. It's uh, red clay and it's Pennsylvania ware, and that could have been used for milk or buttermilk or batter. So there's a lot of things out in the culinary world that you can collect. Some of the things you can find at flea markets, and they run a couple dollars. The rare items might bring hundreds and hundreds of dollars. If you have a, a catalog auction somewhere where the, uh, there's a, a bidding frenzy, uh, you know, things are going into historical societies and museums, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this doesn't really pertain, but there was most recently a sale, believe it or not, where James Buchanan's private cane was sold at auction. I didn't hear what the uh, particular price of the cane was, but there are things that do come on the market. Well, I'm just in that because I grew up on Buchanan Street. There you go. <laughs> so yeah. any, anything you hear, you do. Well, listen, we want to really thank you thank very, you very, very much. much for coming today. and. Uh, Look who's cooking. You didn't go away, did you? <laughs> we were tricking you. We have a special contest today. And the contest, what the contest is going to do, a couple of you asked me, a few of you, quite a few, asked how you get to be on the show. And we have a way for you to be on the show. John's going to show you some, uh, something, and we're not going to tell you what it is. And you have till March 10th to enter the contest. And if you put your name and your address and your phone number and what you think that this item is, it's paper. We'll tell you that it's paper and what it's used for. And we'll have a drawing at the end. And we'll make sure. And then at that time, whoever wins the drawing will get to be on Look Who's Cooking in one week. So I think that should be a lot of fun. To enter this, uh, there's a graphic at the end, but I'll, I'll repeat it to you. Is Look Who's Cooking, Post Office Box 1660, Norristown, Pennsylvania, 19404. And maybe in the corner you could put the word contest so we, could, we can tell which is which or which is the regular mail. And then uh, March 10th, or we will be picking the winner out, and then we'll get in touch with that person, and we'll make arrangements for them to be on the show. So again, this is... Thing. It's paper. We'll give it. Is this, this isn't sticky, right? It's not this, sticky, but it was um, wet before it was used. I will give you that clue. And it does have some very um, functional use in the kitchen. And should we give them just a little bit of clue? How much are you going to give? Uh, maybe just tell them it has something to do with baking. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll go for that. <laughs> Baking's okay. So good That's luck. it, though. No more clues. No more clues. Uh, Send this in by March 10th, and we will have the drawing. And at that time, we'll inform you whoever won, and that person will be on the show. So listen, thank you again thank very, you very, very much. much. <laughs> <laughs> and for real, we're leaving this time, not like the latest time. So good cooking and good eating and good look who's cooking. <laughs>